Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in the after, after afternoon session. So, uh, my talk will be uh, somewhat chaotic and uh, a little bit unprepared, but nevertheless, I hope you can gain some knowledge from that. So, uh, I told you that I will be speaking about the discrete event simulation, it is true. Uh, there will be a part about the discrete event simulation. There will also be a part about the discrete simulation itself, like uh, mostly connected to stochastic recursions. And uh, all of this will be somehow mixed all together because time to time I, I was doing this copy and paste pasting on the slides and then the, the, the sequence might be a little bit weird but nevertheless I think we can we can try to to explain this smoothly so I will not go that much into the detail because the the, the technical de details of these methods you can get from the from the papers of course uh, but uh, I hope that uh, I will try to explain the ideas mostly So, uh, speaking about the discrete event simulation, right? Uh, first of all, uh, I would start with, with the following concept. So, uh, why should we simulate? And what are we doing with that? So, uh, as a researcher, we are trying to uh, study some model, maybe it is a stochastic model uh, in the concept of, in the framework of this conference, mostly there are queuing models. So we are trying to get some knowledge about this model. What we first do is we try to do it analytically. But uh, it is possible only in, the, in the some uh, in some very uh, limited cases. And moreover, uh, I would say that even uh, if you joined us during this conference, you see that many talks were about let's say matrix analytic methods and whatever. But uh, if you boil this down to, to practice, the matrix analytic method itself is a numerical method. So that means that finally, only in very limited number of cases, you can get these analytical expressions of the, uh, of the let's say, inter uh, the performance measures of interest. But mainly you have to do this, uh, not, not uh, in this case, not a simulation, but uh, numerics to study this also in uh, some, some way, like in numerical way. And then try to, to get some uh, results. And then, so uh, again, matrix analytic methods are somewhat limited to, uh, to, to Markovian way of thinking, right? So you have to, uh, you have to assume in your model that uh, there, there are some Markovian depend type of dependencies or, or let's say some uh, exponentials are embedded into the system so that uh, if you assume that your model is modeled by some, some uh, continuous time Markov chain and then uh, the, the sojourn state in this, in, in this chain in any state, the sojourn time will be exponentially distributed with some, with some parameters. So there is a limitation definitely and then if we want to get rid of this we will have to uh, do simulation that is the, the, uh, the, the one of one of the approaches that we can do so uh, again we want to simulate the clean system and uh, we want to express the performance of the system uh, because uh, also you know that the we can study it in, in steady state or in transient state. Uh, in steady state, that means that the system is working for a very long time and it approaches uh, stability. Uh, in transient state, it's much more tricky. Uh, but finally, we want to, to express some performance, let's say average number of customers in the queue through the uh, values of initial parameters of the system that, that, will, that we are studying. So, uh, there are many ways of doing that. Uh, 
it depends on the on the characteristics of the system so one of the popular ways is the discrete event simulation that we will be talking about so uh what are the assumptions behind that why why first of all why discrete event what does this mean so there are some words about that in the in the bottom of the slide right uh, and the point is that uh, the system is such that uh, some dramatic changes happen only to, at, at specific time points that we call events and in between these points the system evolves in a very much deterministic way so that means that in between these points we may not observe the system and we know what will happen uh, up to the point the next event appears so in that sense uh, instead of studying the system in continuous time instead of that we consider only the event uh, event epochs and at that point we observe the system and construct the trajectory uh, in fact we are doing some reconstruction so uh, in between the epochs we can reconstruct what is happening in the system and that's the way the evolution goes here right so uh, there are some concepts on how to do this because uh, <clears throat> of course we can do this technically right but we, we want to we want to prove that if we do it in such a way then the, the numbers that we will be getting they will converge to the average the, the, to the original thing that we are approximating that right so we want to say that for instance we are calculating the mean q size by doing this and we want to prove that this estimate will really converge to the mean q size that in the system that we are observing or simulating so that's not an easy question right because we are doing some numerics we are following some trajectory maybe many times we are approximating like uh, in some way but how to prove that this really converges to, to the original quantity that we want to estimate <clears throat> sorry okay so uh, that is the way it goes so right we, we want to run many trajectories and then uh, do some approximations and then see what it goes so there are uh, different types of processes that we want to estimate and then different methodologies to do that right so again a little bit step back so uh, in, in continuous processes like for instance if you want to model some chemical reject uh, reaction or some biological system maybe it's better to use the continuous time and that means that in most cases you are doing some discretization of the time step and then you are following these time steps and then you get some differential equations or, or, or difference equations in that sense. and then you are uh, trying to, to apply this approach but what if the events are kind of discrete they appear uh, in some way again you get this difference equation That's, that's the way the quantization does itself, right? So this is synchronous approach. But the discrete event, again, coming back to that, it's asynchronous in that sense that we will not observe what is happening in between. And also there are two main types of doing that. So either event-based, as I demonstrated before, right? So we are wandering through the events and observing what happens in the system or process interaction approach. So uh, process interaction is more popular in some languages where, I, where you are thinking of like some agents that are interacting in between. Event-based is, uh, we, we observe the events and the, the uh, system, uh, the system itself is just kind of a state in some state space. So we, we observe the, uh, the, the evolution of these states in the state space but alternative approach i will show it uh, in the second part it's uh, based on stochastic recursions it's kind of a discrete simulation 
Okay, so the main components of the discrete event simulation model are the following. So uh, first we want to define what is the state and in many cases of interest, so let's say in most cases, uh, the state is a some vector of discrete components that are describing the, the system. For instance, the number of customers in the system, or let's say the working state of the, of the processor, is it idle or is it, it is off or it is busy with serving some customer. And the state is such a thing that it changes only at the events. So once an event appears, the state experiences some change. For instance, by event, I can consider an arrival of the customer, right? So then we experience the increase in the number of the customers, and that is the, the, the evolution of the state. The departure is the same. So this is a discrete component. There is also a continuous component that describes something that is related to the time or in fact, in more general case, it is related to some amount of continuous resource, maybe not necessary time, maybe it's just something like work. And these clocks, they time to time expire. And when the clock expires, we call this an event. That is what happens. And these clocks, they possess different speeds. And moreover, up to some extent, we can even think of some interdependence between these types of things. So what does it mean, the, the speed? So we have some global time. We have some concept of a global unit, units of time. And the speed is a relative speed of the clock compared to the global time. So let's say a unit of global time passes and the speed means that this amount of uh, continuous, this amount of continuous, let's say component, maybe work, will be decreased from this clock. What is it, what is it useful for? Let's say, we are modeling some system with uh, speed scaling. This could be the laptop that I'm using to, to show this presentation, for instance. So when it is not very busy, it uh, decreases its speed. And when it has high load, let's say by transmitting the Zoom meeting, it increases the CPU speed. And that's how it's happening. And then this is, modeled by this component, right? So we, we are uh, increasing or decreasing the speed. And in that sense, the clock will be, let's say the amount of data that should be transferred, the speed could be the bandwidth that I have currently. And in some cases, even we can put the zero that will model overtaking or preemption. So for instance, there is some clock associated with some work. And then we, if we put this zero, that means that some work has overtaken us. So we are now suspended. That is how it evolves. So uh, we wander between states by observing the clocks. And when each clock expires, we call this event of this time. For instance, by the clock can be inter-arrival times, residual inter-arrival times. Then when the clock expires, we call this an arrival. So this is the speed of the, of the movement, right? And that's the way it goes. So in fact, this is a three component process with a continuous component and we call it event when this component becomes zero. Uh, 
and it linearly uh, decreases with the speed c of t, right? So, so c of t is associated, is a kind of a vector, right? t of t is a continuous component, c of t is a vector. I, I forgot to multiply here by delta, sorry. So that means that for unit time, uh, the decrease is c of t multiplied by delta. Then uh, the discrete component is changed maybe by uh, sampling from some uh, one step recursion, or maybe it could be some, in general, it's some function of the current state, the event that happened, and the state of the system that we observe. So, uh, in some way, we, we do this evolution, but in, in many cases, it's very, it's very simple and straightforward. Let's say there will be an arrival that means that the corresponding component will be just increased by one or decreased by one in case of departure and whatever. So in general, it is a function, but in simple cases, it's just like something like plus one, minus one, or doing some shifting and whatever. What we have to mention is that uh, when an event occurs, in general, we have to initialize the clock again. So, uh, because the clock is a residual time to event, right? If it becomes zero, then the next event will happen at the same time like the previous one. So, once the event appears, we have to reinitialize the clock in order not to, to make this multiple events simultaneously, right? So, how to do this? Just some some simple examples. Let's say uh, if it is if this clock is is related to the interarrival time of the system, right? So once we have an event, there is zero here, and we initialize it from the distribution of the interarrival time. For instance, it is exponential distribution. We need sample from exponential distribution. So the new value of the clock will be sampled from the appropriate distribution. Right, so is that clear? So once, once the event appears, we sample this, this clock component again from, it is a residual time, right? But when it becomes zero, that means the event appears, we sample the new one, the new time. And in that sense, it is not anymore a residual time, but that clear one. So we sample it, maybe it is based on, in general, it may be based on the current and the previous state of the system. So maybe uh, we have to sample from some conditional distribution, but nevertheless, so we do this sampling. In simple cases, it's very just straightforward sample by cross a coin and get some exponential distribution on it. Okay, so what, that's the way it goes. So we have the timers, they expire, the discrete event is changed, and then we initialize the timers, and then goes on, goes on, and so on, so forth. Then we observe the system state at these points, and we want to get the estimates of the system performance. We have to, to do it in such a way, so we have to configure our system in such a way that from this discrete component, from observing it, we will get the necessary estimates. Because of course, if we want to, if we want to, let's say, uh, to get the estimate of the Q size, we have to observe the Q size, right? Otherwise we will not get this estimate. So, because there are many ways to configure this state space, we can observe just the state of the server, let's say, is it busy or idle? But from this, we will not get the knowledge about what is the Q size. So we have to observe somehow the, the sufficient amount of resources in order to get these estimates after getting the trajectory or align with getting the trajectory. That I, I will draw some conclusions at the, at the, at the end about that. So just a simple, very simple example, uh, MM1Q, right? So uh, queuing system with the one server, exponential interarrival and exponential service times. So maybe we, it is enough to have two continuous time components, which are the timers or clocks, the time until the next arrival and the remaining service time, if any, 
What happens when the service time expires and there is no more customers in the system? We can initialize this with infinite. So in terms of programming, this is this is more easy to initialize this as infinity because from infinity we can subtract any amount and it will be still infinity, right? So there will not be any customer that will expire this time before uh, we get the real customer. Uh, let's say x1 of t is the state, the system state, which is also very simple. In this case, it's not a vector, but just a one component, which is the queue size, or number of customers in the system, right? And in simple case, we have the timers that are decreasing with at rate one, so that uh, the system speed is one for this time, and one for this time. That means that we are working with the original time. So if we want to complicate things a bit, we can say that this, let's say the second, the second clock speed will be alternating between two different uh, speeds, maybe based on the Q size. That will be an example of the uh, system that is uh, doing this uh, speed scaling, right? The speed scaling, for instance, if uh, if we initialize these speeds at the event with different values based on the number of customers in the system, let's say it could be some uh, threshold based policy. If more than 10 customers switch to the higher speed, if less than 10 customers switch to the lower speed, that could be the, the way of thinking of a speed scaling system. So again, I have three components, and this uh, is a very kind of uh, interesting way of uh, expressing many, many, many types of the systems of, of our universe. So uh, there is the name for these. The name is, if you Google around, you can search for GSMP, which is the generalized semi-Markov process. So there was some uh, there was some evolution of the papers about this type of things i, I guess uh, but uh in, in in many papers you get this type of description so discrete component continuous component and the speeds and by using this mechanism you can model many many interesting uh, policies not necessarily the first come first serve policy for instance like, like some overtaking some preemption resume and some even I, I guess uh, even some processor sharing or whatever so uh, it's quite a complicated mechanism but still but right simplistic to to write down the program right so it's very easy to implement this type of program i guess it could be something like 10 or 20 rows very simple so we initialize the system somehow, let's say maybe it starts from zero. Then we run the trajectory by asynchronously switching between the events and observe its evolution. And then we sample the, let's see, for instance, we can get the sample averages. That would be the, mo the most simple thing that we can do. And moreover, this we can do along with the simulation, right? So exactly at each event, we can observe the current estimate of the so we do not need to keep the trajectory, we can just iterate it with the events. Uh, the good point is that we, we do not stick to the exponentially distributed service time, in fact, so arbitrary distributions may be there and even some dependence of the system state and whatever. But uh, we need to define the state appropriately, right? So a more complicated, a more complicated example is, let's say, multi-server model with a sleep state. So what happened is, when uh, when the servers are not busy with the customers, they switch to some sleep regime that they, they switch off maybe the clock or they are keeping some idle time. And uh, they cannot immediately start. They have to sleep until they get awake. And there is, if there is a customer uh, waiting for them, then they will start the service. That's the way it goes. So they do not interrupt the sleep. So in this case, what would be the state and what would be the clock? So uh, the state could be the number of servers 
Oh, I guess it, even, it, even it's a more complicated, it's a more complicated one, right? So let me see. Yeah, okay, if, if, it's, if it is a simple model, then uh, we, could do, we could do more simple like this, not, not like that. I guess there was a mix, mixture of the two spiders there. Right? So uh, in, this, in the simple multi server model, uh, the distinct component would be the state of each server. Is it awake or is it asleep, right? So it is a zero one state. Maybe we can do with the two, three, uh, three values, zero, one, and two. So one is awake, uh, zero is asleep, and two is serving the customer. But in our case, in this model, uh, uh, if it is not serving the customer, it is asleep. So in the more simple case, only two will be fine. Maybe three will be if, if we have some, some kind of different policies for getting awake and asleep. Yes, and uh, the clocks will be in the residual times be before the events. In this case, we will have to initialize the clock uh, in such a way that if the phase is the sleeping phase, right? So it samples from one distribution. If the phase is uh, being served, so if uh, working working phase, then we sample from the service time distribution. So that will be the difference. So the, the, this, this part of the slide, it belongs to a, a slightly different model, the supercomputer model. So in the supercomputer model, each customer occupies not a one server, but many of them. And simultaneously, it takes a bunch of servers, it occupies it for a random amount of time, and then it gets rid of them. So in such a case, the state could be related to the customers that are being served. So then if, if we have M servers, then there will be not more than M customers being served. If, if each of them requires only one server, there will be M of them or less, right? Or less than that. So uh, then the state would be the number of customers, number of server of servers requested by the oldest customers system that are being served. A little bit tricky to understand, but I mean, so straightforward. So they are standing at the service place and we are observing their requirements, right? Discrete requirements in terms of number of servers. Then there is, there is a customer waiting in the queue. We have to observe him also because he is related to what is happening at the server because a if he is standing in the queue, that means that the amount of idle resources is not sufficient for him. So he is affected by the situation that he is waiting. And uh, the queue size is the, the last component that we observe. From this parameterization, it is enough to, uh, to observe the supercomputer, right? In that sense, our model is and then the clocks will be the remaining service times of that customers and the remaining inter-arrival time before the next. So in that sense, there are different number of components here and here, but still we have, so we have M plus one types of events, not more than M plus one, because we can have let's say, only one customer that's being served, right? So, and then someone is waiting to be here. And uh, M plus two components. Okay, so uh, and then we, we can define this type of transition transition function for discrete components and for continuous components. We sample from, from some distribution. That was the example with the sleeping state, right? So we sample if if there is someone uh, if there is someone uh, who is waiting in the queue, then we sample from busy, uh, the service time distribution, otherwise we sample from the sleeping distribution. So there's a little bit more complicated type of function, but pretty straightforward to implement. So there will be if, right, in terms of programming language. There will be an if, and then you choose from that and from that. Oh, okay, that, that was the model we already explained, right? 
So um, we can try to, to do this uh, sample to obtain this sample mean from what we observed. But what if what if they really really they understand them, and the the outcome will be to use the regeneration to, to sample. But I mean the regeneration is not only for dependent variables, but also for a uh, good way of doing this confidence estimation. Also, you can can guess that it's not not easy to. So if we observe the queue, the queue size, the number of customers in the system, if we observe it at this arrival, or let's say at the event epoch and whatever, so uh, we are, we will get the fact that the measurements are, uh, they are uh, dependent. So for instance, the previous measurement was 10 customers in the queue. At the next event, we cannot have zero customers in the queue, right? Because there, are, there were still 10 of them. So likely that we will get 11 if there will be an arrival, or we will get nine if there was a departure. But this 11 and nine, they are affected by the previous value, right? So from 10, we cannot go to zero immediately or go to, to some arbitrary point, right? So we are kind of following some trajectory and we are at this point, this trajectory, the values are dependent, of course, because we follow the same trajectory, right? So uh, by this reason, we need the regeneration. And what is, what is specific to this discrete event simulation with this regeneration, right? So uh, what happens in, in classical world? So uh, instead of measuring this uh, quantity at each of the event epochs, instead of that, we observe some specific thing that we call regeneration cycle. So we separate the trajectory into independent chunks and we accumulate this parameter along the chunk and then from this we get from this we get the estimate by using some formulas but i'm pretty straightforward but we still we have to, to compute them and so we need to define what is a regeneration point in classical systems uh, the regeneration is let's say zeroing of the system so nobody is there nobody is waiting the system is a zero point uh, Unfortunately, this failed in many cases. For instance, in, in, super, uh, in supercomputer modeling, in multi-server models, the, sy the system does not necessarily go to zero. You can prove that it's stable, but still it doesn't go to zero. It never goes to zero, in fact, in some cases. Also, for instance, the, the model with the sleeping state, you could observe there is no regeneration, classical regeneration point, because once the system becomes idle, we still sample from the sleeping from the sleeping time, right? So again, we get this, we get we get affected by by the system state. We cannot get rid of the printed state. So so the idea is uh, to define some regeneration point, and then uh, by separating the trajectory to this regeneration cycle, we accumulate we accumulate these. Uh, this uh, performance measure and then by doing some calculations we arrive at something like formula one which is the confidence interval for the quantity that we desire so again about classical regeneration i told you some there are some problems so what are the what are the approaches how to deal with these type of problems so we could uh, use the wide sense regeneration, but it's a little bit technical or tricky. You can use the renovation if it is there, or some different techniques. And I will tell you now about the artificial regeneration because it's somewhat connected to what I was talking about the discrete event simulation. So uh, the Artificial regeneration is based on splitting, and splitting basically means that we imagine something about the distribution of the random variable that we are studying. So instead of thinking of one distribution, we think that it contains, in fact, two distributions. And we want to 
think of this like uh, instead of a homogeneous sample, we have a mixed sample of two types. One of them follows the desired distribution that we want. Other, other ones follow the residual distribution. So we divide a, a homogeneous group of sample into two groups in some way by tossing the coin. This is the indicator, right? So we throw the coin. And time to time we get, we, we, we think this is from the first group, this is from the second group, and doing like that. What is specific about that is that we want to select the desired distribution in such a way that it possesses some very nice properties. For instance, it's exponential, right? Exponential distribution has memory less properties. We want, instead of our original, we want to get this desired property time to time because we are tossing the coin. So we are throwing the coin, and if we are lucky enough, we get an exponential sample, and it has memory less properties. In that sense, if we come back to the discrete event simulation, let's say that recall that we sample the clocks each time the event arrives, each time we have an event, we sample the clocks. And at that specific point, we sample from some very nasty distribution, maybe like Pareto distribution or whatever, heavy tail one, I don't know, maybe some dependent one. But if we plug the exponential variable there by using this method, so time to time we toss the coin, get the head, and then get the sample from the exponential distribution. This means that if we do this many times by geometric properties, we will get that finally all the clocks are sampled from exponential distribution. At that point, we will lose the memory for all the systems. That would be a specific artificial regeneration. Why artificial? Because we are doing this artificially, right? So we are imagining that our sample is not the original one, but it contains different values. It may take a lot of time, but still the concept is very clear, right? So we are, we are just, instead of thinking of the original system, we are mixing the things together in order to observe time to time this memory less property. So this, this should hold, otherwise we cannot do this, right? Uh, this, this condition should hold. And uh, that's the idea. So, I think I can skip this. This is just kind of a demonstration what is, what, what is going on. Let's say the original was the gamma distribution and then we want to do it time to time, we can do it exponential. So uh, only one thing to note that uh, this is the original, this is the exponential, but in fact it's truncated, truncated exponential, a little bit shifted to the right. And this is how the residual one looks like. So the residual in that sense would be an nested one, but the exponential would give us this desired property. So that's, there are some technical details on that. I think I cannot, I will, cannot waste time for that, but just the idea is very clear so that we, we are observing, we have to enrich the state space because we have to observe in what particular, so re recall that we were tossing a coin, we have to observe the coin also, right? So what is the particular type of this distribution that we are now experiencing? Uh, but in, in, in that sense, uh, in that sense, uh, when we when we observe the system in such a way that the discrete component is in some fixed state, and all the continuous components are sampled from exponential distributions, that would be regeneration. Because at that point, we fix the, we know that this component is fixed, and we do not have any memory. So by this reason, we are losing the memory. Not in a zero system; it is not empty, but still the memory is lost. We can resample at that point from any arbitrary uh, other point, which is this, which has the same distribution, and that in that sense we lose the memory. Uh, this is just a kind of an algorithm how to do that. But if we, if you think of this a little bit, that means that uh, since the regeneration cycles are not dependent in between, 
we can start them simultaneously. So it is not necessary to observe the trajectory of the system itself, but you can start any regeneration cycle from such a, such a point. And in that sense, it's not only, you can not only speed up by starting many independent trajectories, but you can also start many independent regeneration cycles. So that's the extra level of parallelization in that sense. And again, I, I told you that we can uh, use uh, this type of iterators. So you do not need necessarily need to keep all the trajectory because you are only interested in some accumulated uh, amount of, let's say, customers in the queue along the regeneration cycle. So you, you just sum up the things at the event average. So you only need one variable, not, not necessarily keep the whole trajectory because it could be very large. But you only just sum this up and after the after the regeneration cycle ends, you just do this calculation to obtain the point that the estimate for this particular cycle. You put it down and then start the next cycle and so on. Okay, that was it about the about the discrete event simulation. And the, the, what is the other alternative approach? And I will show how they are connected to each other. So alternative way of thinking of that is uh, we are purely focusing on the continuous type of constant. So in that sense, uh, it's somewhat, so in some sense it is similar to the discrete event, but uh, we focus only on one type of event, basically. For instance, that would be arrival. And we are observing one component, but this component keeps uh, Keeps track of or keeps track of the interesting uh, quantity. Let's say the amount of work in the system. That is how the stochastic recursion works. So, for instance, uh, the very famous one is the linear recursion, which is the amount of work observed at arrival point of a customer for each customer. So again, we are doing this asynchronously, right? So we are going from one arrival to another arrival. And this is the continuous quantity, the accumulated amount of work or the residual amount of work in the system. So it's kind of, kind of a piecewise linear process. And uh, again, I think I can skip that. So what is interesting here is that, <coughs> sorry, that we, we can have some interesting monotonicity properties for for uh, by using this type of stochastic recursions. It's pretty straightforward to see that you can prove some some of these type of results. Uh, like for for instance, you are observing at any time point or at arrival time point, then you can get this type of uh, pasta or inequalities uh, that that are interconnecting these quantities. So it is, uh, in many cases, it's so it is sufficient to observe the system only at the arrival point, right? So in, uh, let's say in multi-server case, that will look like that. It's a more complicated recursion because we have to subtract the amount of time passed from all the components, but add a new arrival to only one of the components. So for instance, the customer goes to the server that is least busy server. That, that is how the optical walk is recursion works. But uh, what is interesting, if you look at that, you recall that uh, this is how the discrete event simulation works, right? So we subtract the time from all the clocks and we maybe we can add the time to the clock that, that, that appeared, right? So that in some sense, the, the discrete event is embedded there. So, because we were observed only at the rivals, so we have a more complicated type of structure, but nevertheless, it looks like that. So, uh, again, uh, how to connect these concepts? For instance, we can follow the keeper Wolfram's recursion to, to put the trajectory of the system. Then we get the delays 
If we get the delays, we get the departure times, right? We know the arrival time of a client, we know its delay, we know its service time, then we get the departure time. So if we get the arrival times and if we get the departure times, it's very easy to reconstruct what is the number of customers at each time epoch, right? Because for instance, when there is arrival happening, you have an opening bracket. When there is a departure, there is a closing bracket. You just calculate the number of open brackets, right? That is the number of customers missing in that sense. So you do plus one when you have an arrival, you do minus one when you have departure. You have these times here available. Only problem is that you have to reconstruct these. So in order to get the departures, practically you have to sample all the orbit trajectory, right? Up to the, let's say, up to zero in or, or up to some, again, up to the generation point in time. Now, the, the, there is an interesting trick that if you want to get an, a, a workload on departures, you can run the, the same system again, uh, but then, uh, you introduce some artificial arrivals at the time of departures of zero size. That will be an observer and observing task. And then you again you can reconstruct the queue size, and that means that basically from this type of recursion, from stochastic recursion, you can come down to the discrete event simulation. And if of course you can get vice versa. So just a very complicated example, which is related to the supercomputer model. You can see that it's a bit more tricky because you add this service time to all the servers that I involved to that particular customer. And by using this monotonicity, the stochastic monotonicity, you are doing the interest, very interesting things. You are constructing uh, the so-called regenerative envelope. So in original regeneration, we want to go from zero to zero. Uh, but if we don't go to zero, how to, how to do this, the same type of sampling is that we, we need to uh, uh, to accompany the original process, the original trajectory, with two trajectories that possess the regeneration process. And in that sense, the upper one and the lower one, we will slice it in between, and then in that sense we get this uh, uh, these estimates. They will be very rough, maybe in some sense, but still at least better than nothing. So that's the idea of construction of this regeneration point. Again, the, I mean, so in some sense, there is something very interestingly connected to the coupling. Because uh, I will a little bit talk about this, uh, the, the perfect sampling today, but the perfect sampling also is related to the coupling. And doing this regeneration regenerative envelopes for instance uh, again what, what what is the coupling right so if we have some monotonicity at some point that if we observe a bunch of trajectories they can intersect in one point with some probability let's say so uh, from that point they will evolve in, in the in the same way so for instance uh, what is the idea behind this uh, behind this uh, envelope? Is if we observe these envelopes, and if at some point they intersect, but there, there is an upper one, major and one, and minor and one, but if they intersect, what happens to the original process? He is at the same point, right? Because he is accompanied by them. So by this reason, uh, the idea is that. Uh, if we can do this in, in reverse time, we start from like, let's say, minus infinity or from, from some far away time, and up to point zero, we want to get this coupling here. After that, we, we get the process that is in steady state. Because one of the problems of the discrete event simulation that I forgot to mention about is that first, you have to skip part of the trajectory because it's a warm up period. So, for instance, you need to you need to uh, let's say if you want to model one million of customers, at least ten percent of them you have to throw away, starting from zero, right? So you start from zero, then you you, know, you wait for one hundred thousand customers, you throw this trajectory away, start from the point that where you stopped, and that will be a better estimate because of influence of the zero. 
So here we are trying to do the same thing to get rid of this, uh, but we are doing this explicitly by uh, using this accompanying processes. If they regenerate at that point and it is, and they have the same value, then the original process will have the same value as we in series three. Like that. But that's roughly the idea. So what is the perfect sample? So again, it's connected to the monotonicity of the of the process. So uh, an, an example is the multi-server system that we were talking about today. So multi-server system with uh, let's say general service type distribution and uh, exponential internet development distribution. Uh, the interesting point here is that as an upper bound for that, we are using a specific system specific configuration with a very interesting policy that is very simple and it allows us to sample directly from the steady state of the upper bound that's the idea and by using that since that is an upper bound so what what we are trying to do in fact let me let me just put one graph let me put one graph here. So uh, we want we want to get a sample from multi-server system from the steady state. We want to observe, let's say, workload at the steady state. But we do not want to do this descriptive and simulation, wait for a, lot, a long time, and then get this estimate of that. We want to sample from the directly. How to do this? Uh, again, we recall that there are regenerated periods of that, right? Because this, there is an exponential distribution here, there is no problem with uh, going down to zero. So, uh, but we do not know the exact distribution of the steady state, so we cannot sample from that. How to sample from that? So, let's start from zero. There will be some trajectory, at some time it will go down to zero. Maybe again. Uh, we get the upper bound by using different policy. And we can prove that this stochastical is a stochastical upper bound, but we, by doing some reconfiguration again, by doing the coupling in fact, uh, we get the, the upper bound per trajectory. So it's kind of in, in uh, the original, uh, in the original state space, that would be a stochastic inequality. But if we do this resampling and uh, uh, do it on, on a joint probability space that could be done per trajectory. So that upper bound process will be like that. And the point is that when it hits zero, since it is an upper bound, then the our original process will also have to hit zero. So maybe these regeneration points will not be that effective because maybe there will be some points in between of the original process. But still, at least these points we can sample. So what we want to do is we want to get uh, so we want to get the estimate of this length. So at some let's say random time we observe we split some regeneration period, and we want to observe the residual regeneration. Period. Or uh, so in fact uh, these these guys are distributed in the same way. So in fact, what we want to do, we want to observe this process at that point, but we want to know this length. And to, to know this length, what we are doing, in fact, we are estimating this quantity. But since they, are, they have the same distribution, it's, then, then we get the estimate of this length. And so the process will be this, the following. First, we get this estimate, then we construct our system and observe it at this point. That will be the sample from uh, steady state. The, because the, we get this estimate of this uh, split regeneration period. So what is what is specific behind the upper bound? It is interesting that we are randomly assigning assigning a customer to a server. So we have many servers, we have customers that arrive, and we are uh, interacting with the uh, with the customers in such a way we are throwing them 
to arbitrary servers. Instead of using some wise policy like go to the least busy server or whatever, we are calling them in random way. That basically means that in some sense, again, in some sense, because uh, there, there will be definitely the dependence because if the customer goes to server one, he will not go to the server two, right? So there is a dependency between, but in some way, these servers behave like an independent one. So uh, when they get the load, in fact, they get some sort of reduced load because uh, the, there is an individual, right? So if you are lucky enough, you get the customer, otherwise you do not get, but still uh, you can construct this literary recursion for all these servers. And what is interesting behind that is that this, this type of model, so can you, Maybe this is more. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so if you uh, if you look at that, uh, so these guys are seem like an independent systems. They one server independent systems, and about that systems we know some very nice very nice features that uh, that we can sample uh, the steady state load in that system. That's the idea. So uh, it is in fact the, there is a the result that shows that D is the steady state delay in such a system if we construct it as a geometrical sum. It's kind of logic kinship formula. Right? So we construct it as a geometrical sum of the residual service time, so like that. So the, there is a distribution with, with the formula the number 17. Uh, so we sample these guys from formula number 17, then from formula number 16, we sample the geometrical distributed random variable, plug them in, into the formula 15, and we get the desired sample from uh, steady state load at each of these servers. In that way, we get this point of the upper upper bound. And the only thing that we have to wait for is when, starting from that point, when we get the first zero. Well, that would be the length of this period. So this would be the residual length of the regenerating period, but it would also be the forward residual time. So that's what happens. So we sample that, we sample that, and by using this formula, we get the estimate of the value tau e, which is in fact the length of our desire. We want to have this value. What we do next is, there is only two steps left, right? So now we are sampling uh, the, complete regeneration period. So we know this value. We want to find such a period that overheats this value. So it will be just a normal regeneration period, not the, re the residual one, but the normal one, but such that overheats this value. So then uh, if we get this period, we uh, remember what are the values of the inter-arrival times and service times of that system. And since we have this monotonicity, we take the same values, plug them into the kiefer wolfowitz recursion, which is related to our original system. Before we are trying to construct the estimate for original system, not for the upper bound. For the upper bound, we know everything, but we want to construct the original system. So uh, again, we constructed this value. What is left? We construct such a cycle that overheats this value. And then at this point, we observe our original recursion. But since the, uh, it is one, one point is left, we have to, because there is some, uh, some shifting is happening. So uh, if you observe the upper bound, the systems behave like an independent ones, and they could be the order, uh, the order of the service of the stuff. 
it could be different from the original one. So in that way, we have to do this remixing. So in the original system, we have to start the customers in such a way that they also start in the upper bound. So we have maybe we have to do this permutation. After that, we get this third trajectory monotony. monotonicity. So the uh, original system will be lower than the, this one. We take this value TE, we construct the, con the original trajectory, original trajectory, the lower one, and observe this trajectory at this point. That's it. So again, in two words, first, we sample that point, we sample the value of the steady state upper bound, we get this length. After that, we reconfigure the system in such a way that we want one regenerate, few regeneration periods. We get these values, we permute, permutate them, and then we observe the original system at that point. And that's it. So just some side notes, right? So you can use, the, uh, for instance, I prefer R language because it's very straightforward to implement it there, but there are some packages that are uh, implementing the discrete event simulation approach or uh, multi-server queuing, queuing models like Kipper Hopper type of precautions uh, and also some queuing networks. Uh, but there are also some specific simulators like Arena simulator or NS3 network simulator. You can use them there. Otherwise, you can just do the programming because uh, R is not that efficient in, the, in, the, in terms of speed. But it also can also do the parallel computing. And so, uh, some final notes. Uh, it's better to use analytical results if possible because simulation always gives you some error. But it, it, it also may be a question because in some cases, analytical results are expressed in, say, let's say, in terms of modified vessel functions or some nasty in, in complex integrals that are hard to evaluate. So in that sense, sometimes doing simulation is better than analytical in terms of errors. So uh, it's a nice feature to check the analytical results with the simulation, but be careful because simulation always has, has some, uh, some errors also. So, for instance, it's very hard to distinguish between stability and instability by doing simulation. And for complicated models, simulation is the only option. Well, and and that, that is a nice feature of the mathematics, right? So the same model can be in many years exploited by different applications. And there are some quite very nice hidden treasures in the old papers, so just Save your time to read the literature because they, in the 60s and the 50s there were very nice things that we still have to, to be aware of that. 